screen sharing. You uh, not screen sharing the recording. You can start, which has happened now. So, Victor, the floor is yours. Great, thank thank you very much, Patrick, and and thanks so much to Patrick and Kareem for the invitation. I was thinking about it. I have not been to Copenhagen or to Jerusalem since I was pretty small with my parents, so it's great to be back. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to be talking about, uh, as my, my title indicates, the topology of augmented Bergman complexes. And so these are some new objects. They, they showed up uh, in 2020 in a pair of papers by Braden, Ha, Mathern, Proudfoot, and, and Wong. And um, they're a hybrid between two families of simplicial complexes that are well studied associated to matroids. And, um, you know, well, before I go to the outline slide, we're just going to, you know, study how they, they mix the properties of those. And this is work that you can find on the archive at that location. And I realized I should also give you, I'm going to quickly, I should have gone to the, the location. If you want to follow along, I did post already um, the slides. Here they are. And I'll give you the link in the chat. And, you know, Patrick, if, if people come late, you could always just repeat this, that link. Sure, I can do that. Great, thank you. Okay, so let me advance. Oh, no, right before I advance this slide. This is work that was a project done at the University of Minnesota REU last summer. Um, and so these are all uh, undergraduates from all over the United States. They're really strong students. If uh, any of you ever meet them, you know, I think you'd enjoy talking with them. You know, and I was the mentor and we had uh, some of our graduate students at Minnesota as TAs, Trevor Karn and Sasha Pevsner. And you know, you'll, you'll find the work there on the, on the web. So here's my plan is I'll just, you know, quickly review matroids and emphasize some aspects of matroids that are relevant here. I'll be talking about their independent sets as a way of axiomatizing matroids and their flats as a way of axiomatizing them. And the point is that independent sets will give us one of the simplicial complexes, which are well studied, whose topology we understand. And the flats, when we take the order complex, will give us another class of simplicial complexes whose topology is well studied and well understood. <clears throat> and I'll talk about how both of those are shellable simplicial complexes. So we understand their homotopy type very well. And then I'll reintroduce, if you've never seen it, these augmented Bergman complexes from 2020 that are somehow a hybrid between the independent set complex and the Bergman complex built from the lattice of flats. And <clears throat> I'll explain why they are shellable also. So they're again, well-behaved. And this, the fact that they're shellable is not so surprising. I'll, I'll give a little bit of the context that explains why you would have expected that they might be shellable. So we asked the RU students to provide a shelling. You know, that was kind of the beginning of the project. We weren't too surprised that that could be completed. But what I found interesting was where it went after that is they came up with two families of shellings, which somehow give you two descriptions of the homotopy type. And comparing the two descriptions was kind of interesting. It would tied in with other things that was in the literature. And one of the families of shellings was extremely nice. And so somehow the, the homotopy type of these augmented Bergman complexes in a certain sense is more natural than it is for the independent set complex or the Bergman complex. It's kind of strange. And this, these are the parts that surprised me. So I'll try to explain why I was surprised. Okay, stop me at any time if there are questions. And yeah, Patrick, if I miss a question in the chat, I hope you'll interrupt me so I can- Yeah, I can keep a look on that. Great, thank you very much. So let me quickly review matroids. I'm hoping that many of you have, have seen them before, but just remind you that when I have a matroid M of rank R that's on a ground set E that has N elements, and I'll just always number the elements one through N, it's trying to abstract having <clears throat> N vectors, V1 through Vn, that span an R-dimensional subspace inside of some vector space over any field K. We don't really care too much about which field it is. And I've given you an example here that we'll, we'll kind of carry along through the talk. Here are four vectors in R2, so two-dimensional vector space over R2. 
that um, they span that space. This is a plane that they live in and, and they do span the plane. And if I write them as columns of a matrix, their coordinates. So I picked coordinates so that this is the first standard basis vector, second standard basis vector. This is the vector one, one, so that's there. And this one is the, the negative of the second standard basis vector. Then this matrix, um, is going to be R by N. It will be a full rank because I asked the vectors to span the space. And, um, you know, that's the reason for the name matroid is instead of thinking about this matrix that has these coordinates in it, we're going to abstract just the dependence properties, which subsets of the columns are dependent or independent. And that will be the matroid information. But it begins with a matrix that actually has coordinates and we think of the columns as giving us the column vectors that were V1 through Vn. So as I said, the matroid that we associate to the vectors V1 through Vn, it forgets their coordinates, but it does remember which subscripts, which sets of subscripts were linearly independent sets of vectors. And so I'm gonna call those subsets this is supposed to be calligraphic I of M, the independent sets of the matroid associated to the vectors is defined to be those sets of subscripts such that those subsets of vectors, those columns in the matrix are linearly independent. And in our example, uh, the empty set of columns is always linearly independent. Each of these individual vectors was not a zero vector. I could have had zero vectors. I could have had loops in my matroid is what they're called. And so I could have had uh, that some of one, two, three, or four wasn't an independent set, but not in this case. And uh, all the pairs of vectors like one, two, one, three, uh, one, four are independent, two, four, except I have to omit three, four. Notice that three, four is not in my independent set family. And so that's just reflecting the fact that V3 and V4 are anti-parallel, if you like, but they're linearly dependent, okay? Um, and uh, also notice, of course, because this was a rank two matroid, right? We're in a two-dimensional space. If I take any three element subset, I, J, and K, that's not an independent set. Any questions so far about independent set? Okay, so we have this family of independent sets and this gives us one way to axiomatize matroids. Now I don't need any vectors at all. Um, the point is that if I began with vectors, this set of independent sets, the calligraphic I of M, it satisfies three axioms, I0, I1, and I2, that combinatorially abstract things that we know about independence. The fact that the empty set is always an independent set, that's the first axiom. The fact that if I have Two in the, sorry, two subsets, I and J, that are nested. If the bigger set is independent, linearly independent, the smaller subset should be linearly independent. So it's closed under inclusion. That's what the, the second axiom says. The family of independent sets is closed under inclusion. And the third one is usually the, the most interesting one when you axiomatize matroids. This is some kind of an exchange condition. Let me remind you or, or tell you how what it says. It says that. If I have two uh, subsets that are independent, so I've got a bunch of linearly independent vectors here, another set of linearly independent vectors here, then it's always true that if, if there were fewer, if this was a smaller cardinality subset, the bigger cardinality of subset could donate one of its vectors to make the smaller one have larger cardinality and remain independent. That's what this quantifier statement is, is saying. And so uh, these three axioms, if I just take a collection of subsets of the numbers one through N that satisfy these three, this is the definition of a matroid by specifying its independent sets, okay? So there are different ways to define what a matroid is. This is one of them. And I think I wanna emphasize the different roles of the axioms. These first two, if you think about it, saying the empty set is there and it's closed under inclusion, those are saying that if we make vertices, one, two, three, four, you know, I'm gonna call my vertices here, y1, y2, y3, up to yn, indexed by one through n, 
And you'll see later why I picked wise that has to do with uh, the conventions in, in one of the later papers. If we make them vertices, and if we make a, an abstract simplicial complex on that vertex set, whose faces, simplices, whatever you would like to call them, are the independent sets, then I0 and I1 say we are obeying the rules for an abstract simplicial complex. It's non-empty because it actually has the empty face in the simplicial complex. So there is always that negative one-dimensional face, the empty face. And then this is saying that the, the faces in our simplicial complex are closed under inclusion as they, they should be. But then I wanna emphasize also that axiom I2, in one of the consequences of this business about donating from a, a bigger independent set to a smaller one, if it was too small, that says that this simplicial complex that we've drawn here, like in this case, it's a one-dimensional simplicial complex because the, um, the maximal faces, the facets all have two vertices here, the rank. Uh, axiom I2 implies that they will all have the same cardinality. So all of the inclusion maximal independent sets, those are called the bases of the matroid, because if you think about it, Back when we had actual vectors, those would correspond to subsets of the vectors that are bases for the, for the span of all of the vectors. Those bases should all have the same rank, and that rank would have been the dimension of the space if we had vectors, but now we just call it the rank of the matroid, R of M. And so that's why here we had always the facets, the inclusion maximal faces had two vertices, R equals two, the rank. In other words, the independent set complex is a pure simplicial complex of dimension, the rank minus one. There's always this annoyance when you're doing, dealing with simplicial complexes. A simplex that has R vertices is an R minus one dimensional simplex. And the pure just means all the inclusion maximal faces have the same dimension. Everybody okay? Questions? Good. And just to remind you, why do we even bother talking about matroids as opposed to just sets of vectors? Well, because it's actually more general. There are matroids that are not representable as the independence, sorry, the, I should say that matroids specified by their independence set. It's not true that they're always a set of vectors in some vector space such that those are the linearly independent vectors. You know, and a famous first example is the, the non-Pappus matroid. I've drawn it here in what's called an affine picture. You should really think of, here's a plane in which I've drawn some of these points as being collinear. And you should put the, the origin outside that plane and have vectors that point at those nine points. So it's, those vectors really live in a three-dimensional space, but I've kind of sliced them into a two-dimensional planar picture to, to depict which of them are coplanar. So really one, two, and three are coplanar, Whereas notice, I haven't drawn a line between seven, eight, and nine. I'm insisting that seven, eight, and nine are not coplanar if I drew them in the three-dimensional three picture. And so if you specify a collection of uh, you know, subsets of these numbers one through nine indicated by, um, yeah, all of the subsets of one through nine such that their cardinality is less than or equal to three so that you can't have four of them be linearly independent but some of the subsets of three of them are linearly independent and two element subsets are linearly independent. One, one element subsets are linearly independent. If you make all of the ones of cardinality three, except these, these ones that I've indicated as collinear, they will obey the axioms of a matroid. But the fact that I didn't make seven, eight, nine collinear is violating Pappus's theorem from projective geometry. And so you, you'll never find vectors over any field that represent this matroid. Everyone, okay, questions? Good, so matroids are more general than vectors. That's the point. Good, but there's another combinatorial axiomatization for matroids that'll be relevant for us. And that uses these things called flats, the family of flats, F of M instead. And it's motivated by, again, the case where we're represented by actual vectors, V1 through Vn, the flats for these actual set of vectors representing a matroid would be, you look at the, the subsets uh, you know, of subscripts, the VIs, um, 
when you look at a family of VIs, I and F, such that if I picked a linear subspace in the ambient space and I looked which vectors lie on it, those are the flats F. And so I, I wrote, wrote it like this. For some ambient linear subspace W of V, you look at W intersect your vectors, and those should be the, the ones that index flats. And so just to get it straight in this example, the empty set is the only vector on the origin here. When I take the, that as a linear subspace. Uh, each of them, like V2, lies on a line, and that's the only vector on that line. V1 is the only vector on this line. And I have to be careful now, V3 and V4 are the only two vectors on this line. So there's a flat three, four, and I'm, I'm omitting set braces. Those should really be sets. This is really the singleton set one is a flat, singleton set two, et cetera. And then one, two, three, four is all four of the vectors are the intersection with the improper flat, the whole space W equals V. So you get these flat subsets, and the usual thing that one does, and I'm definitely gonna to wanna to do this, is to not just list them, but order them as a partially ordered set by inclusion. So two is contained in one, two, three, four, empty set contained in three, four. It's, it's not a very interesting partial order in this case, but we will wanna use this example. So this is called the post set of flats, ordered by inclusion. And I'm just still gonna call it calligraphic F of M when I think of it as a post set. And let me just point out how these can axiomatize the matroid because we'll use some of its properties. Again, there are kind of two axioms that are not saying very much, although they do have some consequence. Always the set of all of the vectors, E, which is one through N, that is always a flat because you take the full space and intersect it with the set of vectors, you get everyone. So that's your F zero axiom. Uh, then there's the axiom that says, if you take two flats, so you, they were the vectors intersecting two subspaces, intersect the two subspaces and now look which vectors are in it, you'll get the intersection of the flats. And so any two flats, if you intersect them, will give you another flat. So that's a slightly non-trivial thing. And I'm gonna tell you to ignore this, this third axiom. It's interesting, but let's, I'll just talk about its consequences. I don't really wanna emphasize it too much, what it's saying. What I want to point out is, again, those first two axioms actually tell us something about the post set of flats. That post set of flats ordered by inclusion is actually a lattice. And how do I know that it's a, a lattice? I'm always working, by the way, with finite ground set, one through n, so that to get rid of some technicalities in the infinite case. It's a lattice because it has a top element. E is going to be like a one hat, somebody who is you know, contained in everyone else at the top of the post set. And because of axiom F1, any two elements will have uh, a meet. When I intersect the, the flats, that gives me a meet, a, a greatest lower bound for F and G in the, lat in the post set of flats. So I have meets exist, and I have that there's a top element. That means that joins also exist because the join of two elements is the meet of everyone that, which is above them. You take the pairwise meets of everyone above F and G, and you get their join. So it is uh, a lattice just because of, of these two. And then the, the axiom that I'm telling you not to read too closely, F2, makes it a much more highly structured lattice. It's a, a, what's called a geometric lattice. So it's atomic. Every element is the join of atoms, which are the things lying above the, the bottom of the post set, just above the bottom of the post set. And it's what's called upper semi-modular. So it's ranked, it has a rank function which obeys some semi-modular inequality, which I will not write down. But that's somehow the F2 makes it a, a much nicer than just a lattice. Questions? Okay. So let me now talk about shellability for these two simplicial complexes that will come up. I've shown you one of the simplicial complexes, the independent set complex. I haven't shown you yet the other one, which will be the, the Bergman complex or the order complex of the proper part of the lattice of flats. Good. So 
let me just remind you what shellability is for simplicial complexes. I'm only going to be dealing with pure simplicial complexes. Both of the one, all, all of the ones that we'll consider in this talk are pure. So all of the facets, the inclusion maximal faces have the same dimension. Um, let's call them R minus one dimensional. So all facets have R vertices on them. And if I have a pure R minus one dimensional simplicial complex, we call it shellable. If we can order the facets, phi one, phi two, and kind of build up the complex one facet at a time in a very controlled way. So that when a new facet, phi j, comes in, in the shelling order, you look at the subcomplex generated by the previous facets, phi one, phi two, up through phi j minus one, take their union, look at all of their, fa their faces that creates, that generates a subcomplex. And the new facet intersects that previous subcomplex in a pure R minus two dimensional subcomplex of its boundary. Remember, it is R minus one dimensional. And so we're saying it intersects the previous subcomplex in something pure of co-dimension one within the new facet that you've added. And so I've given you an example from our independent set complex of that matroid. Here it is, the whole thing. But when I build it up in a shelling order, let's say I start with that facet phi one, which is right there. And then I add in the, the facet phi two. Well, when I add it in, I look at its intersection with what I already had and it's just this vertex on its boundary, which is pure zero dimensional as a subcomplex of this pure one dimensional facet that I added in. So that's good. It obeyed the, the shelling condition. And next I add in this facet phi three, it intersects the previous subcomplex in that zero dimensional vertex as a part of its boundary. So that's, that's a good shelling step. Then I add in the, the facet phi four. Now that one's a little more interesting because its intersection with the previous complex is those two vertices on its boundary, but that's okay. It's pure zero dimensional, so that's good. And then I add in the facet phi five. That's the last one in the shelling order, and it intersects in those two vertices on its boundary, which is pure codimension one within its boundary. So this was a, a shelling. Everybody okay? Question? Yes. So was shelling for graphs, like in the one-dimensional case? Yeah. Does that exist if and only if it's connected? Or? Absolutely, okay, yes. Okay, good. First exercise in shelling. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, yes thanks. exactly. <laughs> Shell shellable one-dimensional complexes are connected graphs, correct. Good. And I, I should clarify though, Patrick, shellable uh, pure, pure shellable. Yeah. Because what you would, there's also a notion of non-pure shellability that Birner and Wax developed later, uh, which is interesting. And uh, that would allow for the graphs that you have some isolated vertices. Okay. But it would not allow you to have two connected components that each have edges. That would be bad. That would make it not non-pure shellable. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Good. And so why do we care about shellability? Well, it's it's not that many simplicial complexes are shellable. Many that come up in combinatorics that are well behaved are shellable, but it's it's a rare property among simplicial complexes but it definitely determines the homotopy type of the simplicial complex. And in a way it kind of trivializes and it really shows you that it, the topology is much simpler than you may have been expecting. So how does it determine the homotopy type? They will end up being, just to just spoil the surprise, wedges of spheres, homotopy equivalent to one point wedges of equidimensional spheres when they are pure and shellable. And how do you know how many spheres there are in the wedge? You go back to your shelling order, right? You had the, the order on the facets and certain facets contribute one of the spheres in the wedge. So you call phi sub j a homology facet in the shelling, or sometimes they're called fully attached facets in the shelling. There, there are different names that I've seen in the literature. If when you look, when you added in that facet in the shelling, phi j, and you look at the subcomplex generated by the previous, it was attached along its entire boundary, which is pure of co-dimension one. But those fully attached facets are the ones that contribute to the these spheres in the wedge. And so that's the proposition. It's some you know reasonably simple uh, 
combinatorial topology statement that if you have a pure, say D-dimensional shellable complex delta, then when you look at the topological space, right, you no longer think of it as an abstract combinatorial object, but create the usual geometric realization. That's what I mean by these double bars around delta. That topological space is homotopy equivalent. I'll use that equivalent symbol for homotopy equivalence to uh, a one-point wedge of D spheres, all of them of dimension D, the dimension of the complex. And the number of spheres that you wedge together is that number of homology facets in your shelling. So you might've thought that that would depend upon which shelling order you picked, but it, it turns out it doesn't depend upon that ordering. So the beta is the number of homology facets. Maybe I'll just to, show you again in this picture. So who were the homology facets in our showing that we did before? Remember it was y, uh, sorry, phi four and phi five. The last two that we added in here were the ones that were fully attached along both of their boundary vertices. And one way to see why this implies that it's a wedge of spheres is if you take them out, the homology facets, remove phi four and phi five, what you get is this thing, which looks like a tree. It's contractible, and that's always true. If you have a, a pure shellable complex, if you take puncture, take, take away its homology facets, you can show that the remainder is contractible. And if you think about contracting it all down to some point, then the phi four and the phi five, the homology facets, they get contracted down to spheres. Their, their entire boundary gets collapsed to a point. And so this is how you get this wedge of spheres for the homotopy type. Everybody okay? Right. Good. So what I wanna now tell you about is that the independent set complexes are always shellable. And then I'll introduce the Bergman complexes from the lattice of flats and they're always shellable. So let me tell you about those results, which are pretty old actually. Now we're gonna go back to 1980. So what is this, uh, 40 years ago. Um, Proven and Bolera showed that for any matroid, the independent set complex is shellable. And by a very reasonable shelling order, they, they really proved something stronger. So there's some, a stronger notion than shellability called vertex decomposability that implies it. That's what they actually showed. But one of the consequences of the way they did the vertex decomposition shows that if you lexicographically order the bases, which were the our facets, our maximal faces in the independent set complex. And I'll show you what I mean by lexicographic order. That gives you a shelling order on the facets always. So, so in, in our theorem, example, is, sorry. So in this theorem, does this pure shellable? I mean. Yes, it's pure, pure and shell. We knew that it was a pure simplicial complex from that third independent set axiom. So uh -huh. yeah, pure and shellable. Yeah, good. So, um, the lexicographic order is actually the one that I was using when I said phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, phi five. That was the lexicographic ordering. And what do I mean? Well, phi one has vertices y one and y two. It corresponds to the basis of the vectors one and two, or, or just the elements one, two, that basis. And you just write them in increasing order, one less than two, you write them in that order, or one, three, or one, four, two, three, two, four. Just pick the convention where you list the elements of the basis in increasing order, and then compare lexicographically. You know, first look at their first positions. If they tie, check their second positions to compare. And that's what I mean by the lexicographic order on the bases. Does everyone understand what I mean by lexicographic? So that was our shelling. It was a, a proven Bolera shelling. By the way, this is kind of another interesting axiomatization of matroids is the way I numbered the ground set elements one through N is sort of arbitrary, but it, here it gave rise to the shelling. It doesn't matter how I order the, the ground set elements one through N. This lexicographic order will always give a shelling. And this is another axiomatization of matroids there. The pure simplicial complexes such that no matter how you label the vertices one through N, the lexicographic ordering on their facets gives you a shelling. I think this, was proven by Anders Bjerner at some point. This is another way to say what matroids are. Okay, and so they're shellable, which means we should understand their homotopy type. So we really need to know 
how many spheres there will be in the wedge for the independent set complex. What is that beta, which was the number of spheres, the top Betty number. That's why I called it beta. It's a Betty number. And uh, one way to say it, there's, there's a couple of ways of saying it, is that it's the top polynomial for the matroid evaluated at x equals zero, y equals one. So I'm not gonna remind you what tut polynomials are very much. You know, I'm not gonna give you a definition, but this is some interesting combinatorial invariant and isomorphism invariant of matroids. It's a polynomial in two variables, x and y. It shows up in all sorts of invariants, interesting other combinatorial invariants of matroids and graphs are evaluations of tut polynomials at, you know, you pick the values for the x and the y. This is one of those interesting evaluations is x equals zero, y equals one, tells us about how many spheres there will be in this wedge. And another way of saying it that is somewhat less natural is after we've ordered our basis elements one through n, you can talk about which of those uh, bases give us homology facets. It turns out they're exactly the bases that have what's called internal activity zero with respect to that ordering one through n. And I'm not even going to define internal activity. It, there's an expression for the tut polynomial as x keeps track of the number, the internal activity of bases, y keeps track of the external activity. It's some statistic that depends upon the ordering of the vertices one through n. And it's slightly unnatural, but this is actually the way Tut originally defined his Tut polynomial was tracking these two statistics on the bases. It's a, a bivariate generating function for the bases according to this internal activity and external activity. So this is a, another way of saying it is those are the bases that give homology facets to the ones of internal activity zero. Okay. But anyway, that, the, the point is we have some ways of thinking about what the homotopy type is for the independent set complex. Everybody okay with the proven Bolero result? So where do I get this other simplicial complex that we'll consider this other, you know, when it's been considered since quite a long time ago? The flats, since they're a partially ordered set, a post set, they give us, of course, another simplicial complex, which is its order complex. And let me just remind you or tell you that when you have a post set, you make its vertices in the post set. I'm gonna create a vertex for every element, little p in the post set. I'll call the vertex x of p. I use y's for those other things. Now I'm using x's for vertices. So you have a vertex for every element in the post set. And whenever you have a sequence of elements in the post set, which are totally ordered, you make a, a simplex. So the simplices or the faces in this order complex of the post set are the totally ordered subsets within the post set. Very standard construction. It's been studied, you know, about since like the 1960s, 70s, at least by the combinatorial people. I guess in topology, this is the nerve. When you think of the post set as a category, it's the nerve of the category. But anyway, it's it's a well-studied thing. And there's kind of three versions that we're going to need to to look at here. Um, when I start with the the lattice of flats f of m, and I make the order complex of the lattice of flats. Well, let me show you what happens here. We had the empty flat one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. So now let's look at some totally ordered subsets like empty, two, one, two, three, four. That was totally ordered. And so I get X empty, X two, X one, two, three, four is that filled in triangle, that simplex. And you can see I get kind of three of those filled in triangles, that one also, that one also. And they come from the three maximal chains in the lattice of flats, maximal totally ordered subset. But notice this thing's contractible and it's contractible for obvious reasons. Empty set is contained in everyone else. And so X sub empty gives us a cone point in this simplicial complex. You know, it's the apex of a cone and the base looks like this. Or that thing is also contained, the, the improper flat contains all the rest. And so that vertex for the improper flat X sub E is always a cone point where the base of the cone looks like this graph. And so I'm actually gonna want to consider because it'll show up in the augmented Bergman complex, removing that cone point. So only take 
the order complex after you've removed this element from your post set. And then you, what's left is that post set and it, the simplicial complex, its order complex looks a lot like the post set itself because it's one dimensional. And that's still contractible, but I, it's, this one is the cone over something that is the actual Bergman complex, which is not contractible. If I remove both the top and the bottom, that's called the proper part of the lattice of flats. And that gives us this Bergman, sorry, that order complex of the proper part of the lattice of flats where I remove both the closure of the empty set. There might've been loops in my matroid, which is why I'm writing the closure of the empty set in case there were some vectors that were like the zero vectors. That's what loops are like, or loops and graphs give rise to these. That's at the bottom. This is at the top. If I remove them and take the order complex, just of this part, I get something that actually has some topology, some interesting topology. It's not a cone. In this case, it's three points, you know, corresponding to these three flats. And you should think about that as a two-fold wedge of zero spheres. So a zero sphere is two points. It's the boundary of a, a one disk, which is a line segment. Zero sphere is two points. Here's another zero sphere. I wedge them together at the wedge point, which is where my thumbs are. That gives me three vertices. And that's a two-fold wedge of zero sphere. Because this is a, a shallable complex, this one I'm, we're going to call the Bergman complex, even though it was considered many, many years ago without that name. In tropical geometry, it kind of came up again, and people renamed it the, the Bergman complex. And pardon me, I'm going to call this one delta underscore or, or at underline M, and its cone. Uh, sorry, later we will get to the delta M, but I'm going to consider this Bergman complex with this strange notation with the, the underline, and we'll consider its cone with this X empty as a cone point because it'll show up inside the augmented Bergman complex. Okay. Part, it's a strange notation, but it'll, I'll explain later why that happened. And the point is that, again, around 1980, when people were thinking a lot about shellability, pure shellability, Adriano Garcia had proven that for any matroid, the order complex of the lattice of flats, or when I remove one of the cone points, or if I remove both cone points, they are all shellable simultaneously by you know, an ordering on the maximal chains in the lattice of flats. And it's again, a lexicographic order. Let me just briefly tell you how Garcia lexicographically ordered those maximal chains in the lattice of flats. You take the empty, I should really take the closure of the empty set. Sorry, that's a, a typo. Closure of the empty, and then flat one, flat two, flat three that are nested. And if this is a maximal chain, it's going to have, uh, I think, R steps. And you end with uh, the improper flat at the top. And he wrote down a sequence of edge labels at each step. When you go from one flat to the next one, you just write down the smallest element, the minimum element that's in this flat, but not in that one. You look at the, the set complement, you take the smallest label element in there, and you write that down as a, a number in your edge label sequence. I've done it here, for example. If you go empty, two, one, two, three, four, that's a maximal chain of flats. The smallest thing that's in two but not empty gives me the edge label two. The smallest thing that's in one, two, three, four, but not two gives me the edge label one. And so empty to three, four, I label that edge with the three, three, four to one, two, three, four, I label with one because it's the smallest element in the complement. And you write down these sequences of edge labels and you lexicographically order them and it gives you a showing, is what Garcia showed. He proved this actually more generally for upper semi-modular lattices, not just for geometric lattices, but for our purposes, let's restrict to this case. And so that gives us a shelling order on the three facets here, which you can check that it's a shelling, or here, it's the same ordering, or here, it's the same ordering. They're, they're all pure and shellable by this Garcia lexicographic ordering. Everybody okay? Good. So 
we should also try to find out what is the number of spheres in the wedge then. It's homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres. Because of the dimensions, I'm gonna focus on the, the one that actually has some interesting homotopy type, the one that's not a cone. So this is our Bergman complex, where I remove the two cone points. It's homotopy equivalent to a bunch of rank of the matroid minus two dimensional spheres. If you check those maximal chains and you remove the top and the bottom, they give simplices whose dimension is the rank of the matroid minus two. And the number of spheres in the wedge is again a tut polynomial evaluation. This time, x equals one, y equals zero, rather than x equals zero and y equals one. It's for, for people who know about the duality of matroids, which swaps the x and the y in the tut polynomial. It's like the dual evaluation. And again, because of Tut's formula for what the Tut polynomial is as a bivariate polynomial, you could say that the homology facets are indexed by um, bases of external activity zero rather than internal activity zero. So two, two ways to say what the homotopy type is for this Bergman complex. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the old history of how these complexes were well understood in their homotopy type. Any, any questions? Good. Yeah, so what about this augmented Bergman complex? Well, so we've, as you all I think are probably aware, there was just amazing progress in matroid theory, you know, starting in the 2010 roughly and, you know, proceeding through papers of Huh and Huh and Katz and Kareem and, and Huh and Katz, in which the Bergman complex played a role in these Chow rings of the matroid and the Lefschetz properties for the Chow rings and the Kaler package and, and so on. And then just in 2020, another you know, huge piece of progress building on that came in, in these two papers by Tom Braden, Junha, uh, uh, Jacob Mathern, Nick Proudfoot, and, and Botan Wong. And What's an interesting part of it is they naturally had to consider a simplicial complex. This is delta sub m without the underline. Okay, so this is somehow for them the primary object rather than the Bergman complex, this augmented Bergman complex. It's a hybrid between the independent set complex and the Bergman complex. And so it's got the y1 through yn variables that are you know, from our independent set complex one for each element of the ground set. And then it's got these flat variables, X sub F, which were like the ones that were showing up in the Bergman complex for chains of flats. And who are its simplices? The simplices are, well, you take a subset of the Y variables indexed by a set I, if it's independent, an independent set of the matroid, and a bunch of <coughs> vertices that are indexed by flats, uh, proper flats, so uh, we don't allow that x sub e, the, that we take away that cone point, and you insist on a compatibility between the independent set and all of these uh, proper flats. Well, first of all, those, those flats have to form a chain in the, in the post set of flats, just like in the Bergman complex, but they also must all contain the independent set that you picked among the y's, so it's some compatibility between the two. And let me just show you an example to, to give you some feeling for what's going on. Well, first of all, it's actually going to end up being pure dimension rank of m minus one. It's actually going to contain the independent subset complex as a full dimensional subcomplex in blue, right? Remember, this was our independent set complex. Well, there it is right there. It's the blue simplices. And that's the case when you didn't have any X variables in that compatibility condition, you just only had the Y variables and you pick an independent set. Or maybe you didn't have any Y variables. Well, then you had this chain of proper flats and that's this pure subcomplex, which is, it's not the Bergman complex itself, but it's the one where I allow the, the closure of the empty flat, that vertex as a cone point. So the cone over the Bergman complex naturally lives in here as this red, pure, full dimensional subcomplex of this augmented Bergman. But there are also these hybrid simplices, like these purple ones, that are in this augmented Bergman complex, where I've got an independent set and it's contained in the flat 
or the chain of flats if it was longer. So this Y2 is an independent set two. It's contained in the flat, which was just two. Or here's a more interesting one, the flat X34, right? It had a vertex and it contains the independent set, which is just three, and it contains the independent set, which is just four. I'll let you stare at that for a moment, this augmented Bergman complex. Any questions about it? Okay. Let me just do another special case, but this one is a deceptive special case, right? It's the Boolean matroid. It's the most simple matroid around. And yeah, lots of things happen for the Boolean matroid that don't happen more generally, but it's a, it's a nice example. For the Boolean matroid, every element of one through n is an independent set. It's the situation where you, if you're representing it by vectors, they were a basis for your R dimensional space, or I guess now R is N, so it's an N dimensional space. In that case, Every element is independent, sorry, every subset of the elements is independent. And so the independent set complex is the full simplex. Like for n equals two, it's this two simplex. For n equals three, it's this three simplex, including the interior. And then what does the um, Bergman complex will look like the barycentric subdivision of the boundary of a simplex whose vertices have been labeled one through n, but we're taking the cone over it. So we're actually including the Berry Center in the middle. You could think of this, I, I've drawn it kind of broken, but if you straightened it out, this would be the Berry Centric subdivision of a simplex, this picture here, where, where that's the Berry Center. Or here for n equals three, if I drew the Berry Centric subdivision of a, of a two simplex, it's isomorphic to this picture where the X empty is in the middle of the Berry Centric subdivision. It's the Berry Center of the simplex. So these are the cones of the Bergman complexes. They're these nice balls. This was a ball. And now this augmented Bergman complex puts them together. It, take, it puts this simplex in the front, maybe, the blue one. It puts this barycentric subdivision of a simplex in the back in red. And then there's these hybrid purple simplices between them. And it creates a nice sphere, a single sphere, not a wedge of spheres which is what the boundary of a polytope called the stellohedron. This is something that had come up back in the work of uh, graphosy, graphososohedron that was studied by uh, Carr and Devados, I think originally, but it's some nice well-studied family of simplicial polytopes. And this sphere is the boundary complex of it. Here, it, it looks like a, a boundary of a pentagon. And it's deceptive because in general, I'm gonna show you that these augmented Bergman complexes are pure and shellable. So they're wedges of spheres. It's, this is the only situation where it's a single sphere. That's the, that's the end of the story. It's never a single sphere again. Questions? Okay. Let me tell you briefly about why, why did they introduce this hybrid? Uh, B, H, M, P, W, you know, it, how, how did it come up in their, in their work? Well, it's similar to how the, the Bergman complex comes up in the work of, of Kareem with uh, Jun He and, and uh, Eric Katz, right? There is a certain ring for, for Kareem and, and his colleagues. It was the chow ring for the matroid. And the chow ring for the matroid actually turns out to be the quotient of the Stanley Reesner ring for that proper part of the complex uh, for the uh, post set of flats. Uh, and so it's, this, it's the Stanley Reesner ring for the, the Bergman complex, but then you mod out by some additional linear relations that are interesting and have to do with torque geometry. There's a certain simplicial fan and these are the usual linear relations you mod out when you wanna you know, connect your fan with uh, an associated toric variety. Anyway, in the augmented story, same thing. They, they had an augmented chow ring that they call CH of M, okay? And what is that augmented chow ring for them? It has variables for just the, the ground set elements, Y1 through IN, blue variables. It has variables like in the, burden, in the chow ring did for indexed by flats that are proper flats, but could be empty. There's Stanley Reesner relations so that you you mod out certain relations and you would get the Stanley Reesner ring for the 
for this simplicial complex, if people have ever seen that. And that just means there's a variable for every vertex in the simplicial complex. And if uh, a subset of variables don't correspond to a face, you set the product to zero. So you, you mod out by the products of variables that correspond to non-faces in the complex. And in this case, that's taken care of by, by these relations, two flats that are incomparable. You, you make the product of those two variables zero. If you have uh, a vertex variable from the independent set complex and it's not contained in the flat, those two variables you have to set to zero. There should be some more that you set to zero if you're writing down just the Stanley Reesner relations, but they end up being taken care of by this. These linear relations that you mod out by, because there's an underlying fan, which tells you about what linear relations to mod out by to connect with the toric geometry, they will enforce some more Stanley Reesner relations that you might think are missing here. Namely, the ones that say, why do you only get independent set complexes giving non-zero monomials? Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to do justice to their story, but in this augmented chow ring, it's amazing. I mean, just like the chow ring was amazing, the augmented chow ring is, is even you know, more amazing. These y1 through yn, they generate an algebra that they call h of n. Uh, on the one hand, they call it the graded Möbius algebra of m. On the other hand, uh, I think they call it the cohomology of the, the matroid. And it has a, a geometric precedent in the, in the representable case. There's a reason why they call it the cohomology of the matroid, but I'm not gonna get into that. So the y's generate a subalgebra, h of m. And then there's, because the whole ring, right? This thing has this as a subalgebra. This is a module over that subalgebra. There's a really interesting submodule that they call the intersection cohomology of the matroid. And again, with a geometric counterpart in the representable case, where it really is some kind of intersection homology. And they're just remarkable properties. The full Chow ring they show satisfies the Kähler package, just like in the, the Chow ring satisfied the Kähler package. This submodule, this IH of M, also satisfies a version of the Kähler package. There are Lefschetz elements around. It's different Lefschetz elements here than, than here. So they actually tell you who you can point to as Lefschetz elements for the Kähler package in these two stories. I'm not gonna say what the Kähler package is. I hope some of you have seen it before, but I just don't, don't have time. But the consequences are just remarkable. So when you look at the Hilbert series, you look at the dimensions, the graded pieces for the cohomology of the matroid H of M, this interprets the rank sizes in the lattice of flats, right? How many things you have at each rank, which are usually called Whitney numbers of the second kind, the W sub K. And then, so that's, this interprets those Whitney numbers but the fact that it sits inside of this thing, IH of M, satisfying the Kähler package, proves the Dowling and Wilson top-heavy conjecture from 1974 about matroids, saying roughly speaking, the ranks at the top of the matroid are bigger than ranks at the bottom of the matroid, the, the complementary ranks. I'm not gonna give you the full statement, but this is an old conjecture that had seen very little progress for you know, 40, 50 years. And then, they, they finally get it from the Kähler package here and what the HM interprets. And this thing, the IH of M, the intersection cohomology, it's Hilbert series, the dimensions of its graded pieces, when you look at those coefficient, they are the coefficients for something that had come up in the, the theory of kajdan lustig polynomials for matroids. There was some auxiliary polynomial that had defined called the Z polynomial. And this mysterious Z polynomial it seemed to have unimodal coefficients. They seem to be non-negative. Well, yes, the Kähler package for IH of M proves that they're non-negative and they're unimodal, symmetric and unimodal. So they go up and they go down and they have a symmetry. And then also in that kajdan lustig polynomial theory for matroids, which is analogous to kajdan lustig polynomials for Coxeter groups, the kajdan lustig polynomial just seemed to have non-negative coefficients and it was hard to prove. That is the, those coefficients turn out to be the Hilbert series for this thing considered as a module over your, your cohomology ring when you mod out by the Y variables. So again, this thing resolved a conjecture that had been sitting around for a few years, not as many years because this Kajdan-Lustig polynomial theory was more recent. 
And it's this kind of a functor. I was talking with Nick Proudfoot about it. Modding out by the Y variables is what they call the, the underlying functor. That, that is why they have delta of M as the augmented Bergman. And they think of modding out by the Y variables gives you the objects where they, they put their underlines on it. So it seems a little strange historically that the, the later one doesn't have the underline, the earlier one does, but that's why it's because of this, that functor. And Vic, could you tell us what is the IHM? How it is defined? Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. It is really slippery. They give two definitions in their paper of what this submodule is over HMM. One of them is not very explicit, but it's cleaner. And it says, view the big ring as a module over this algebra. And you have a Kroll-Ramach-Schmidt theorem that says, this decomposes uniquely into indecomposable modules over this. And this is the unique indecomposable sum n that contains the element one from the ring. But then it doesn't tell you very much about how to compute it. And then they give you another, frankly, horrible recursive way of describing this thing. And they have to prove that those two are the same. But it, the recursion, you know, it's like a kind of a flat recursion. They do it for smaller flats and quotients and subs. And yeah, it's, it's horrible. And is it this recursive interpretation that then uh, gives the Kastanustig uh, thing? Yeah, so that they know the Z polynomials satisfy a certain recursion um, and they interpret that recursion using uh, Bellinson, Bernstein, Deligne, uh, I'm forgetting an author, McPherson, you know, the decomposition theorem for intersection cohomology. They match that with a recursion that they knew for the Z polynomial, for example. Yes. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Good. So... There, that's why the augmented Bergman came up. It's, it was to create this, this ring. So it's really, there's an underlying fan, not just a simplicial complex. And this ring would be corresponding to that fan. Any further questions before we talk about the shellability? Okay. Now, why would you expect that the augmented Bergman complex was shellable? Well, First of all, it contains I of M as a full dimensional shellable subcomplex. The Bergman complex is a full dimensional shellable subcomplex. And in their work, the BHMPW, they needed a weaker thing than shellability. They needed gallery connectedness. This is sometimes called connected in co-dimension one. And it just says the, the augmented Bergman complex, pick a, a facet and another facet here. I've drawn them as if they were triangular facets, phi and phi prime you'll always be able to walk through the facets in a sequence such that each pair of facets you know, that are adjacent in the walk share a co-dimension one face. If you think about it, that's, that's much weaker than saying that the thing is shellable. In shellable complexes, every facet can walk backwards to the first facet, but this, they're just saying that there was some, some such path. They needed this because this often comes up in these chow ring, uh, computations when you're trying to show that the top of the chow ring has, or the augmented chow ring has dimension at most one, you often use this co-dimension one connectedness condition to show that. Anyway, this would make you suspect that these things were shellable. Oh, sorry. And so I asked the RU students, okay, can you shell these, these augmented Bergman complexes? And in fact, because they have these two pure shellable subcomplexes inside of them, I asked them if they could do it so that they start with one of them and, and kind of head toward the other one. Could they shell it so that the independence complex was shelled first as an initial segment? And could they also do it so that the Bergman complex or the cone over the Bergman complex was shelled first as an initial segment? And yes, they pretty quickly were able to come up with families of shellings that do them both. I guess I'm, I've listed them as type one and type two, these two families of shellings. The type one, it's gonna do the cone over the Bergman complex first, those facets, and the facets in the independence complex come last. And in type two, it's the opposite. You do the independence complex facets first and the cone over the Bergman facets last. Okay, what I'm saying is this is not too surprising. If you, if you sat down and thought about it, you would come up with these shelling orders. And I'll just say that 
the very first thing that these shelling orders do is when you take those facets, let me just go back to the definition of the augmented Bergman. When you take the facets, there are some which are just purely like a, a basis and a maximal independence set, or they have fewer of the Y variables and some of the X variables. You just first classify them according to how many Y variables do they have versus how many X variables. And the first thing that the, these two kinds of shelling orders do is uh, either penalize you for having too many Y variables and, and more X variables or vice versa. The first thing they do is check the cardinality of how many Ys and Xs you have. And, and then they start breaking ties using the proven Bolera rules or using the Garcia rules. It's, it's, it's not too hard to come up with these shelling orders. So I've drawn the picture here, like the type one shellings, they're supposed to do the cone over the Bergman complex first. So they start by shelling the red stuff they start adding in some purple facets, and then finally they put in the, the basis facets, which are the, the maximal simplices in I of M. One thing I want to point out here, notice in this picture of this type one shelling, actually every one of those basis facets, when you add it in, is fully attached as a homology facet. Every single facet of the independent set complex in these type one shellings gives you a homology facet, and they are exactly the homology facets. At the previous stage, it was contractible. You didn't add in any homology facets. The type two does the opposite. It starts by shelling the independence complex, starts adding in some of these purple hybrid facets, and then finally finishes with the cone over the Bergman facets. Are we okay? I'm not telling you the shelling orders exactly, but it's, it's not too so if, if I just may, are these, types like inherently different or can I just uh, think of them as one uh, as one of them as the reverse of the other? No, they're inherently different. Okay. Yeah, because we'll see actually the, the beta expressions that they give are, are different and with an interesting comparison. Yeah, not a trivial okay. comparison. Good, yeah, good question. And then do you oh, get sorry. also uh, algebraic and uh, also uh, numerical consequences for these? Uh, yeah, so I'm about consequences. to tell you some you know numerical and topological consequence Iran, but let me reinterpret your question as as a harder question. I wish I knew of a way in which this shelling and the usual Stanley Reisner theory, the shelling would tell you something about bases if we picked a linear system of parameter to quotient the Stanley Reisner ring. That's not what happens in the Chow rings or the augmented Chow rings. You go beyond a linear system of parameters. It's a bunch of linear elements that makes an Artinian quotient with too many things to be parameters. And so I actually don't know of interesting algebraic consequences for the Chow ring or augmented Chow ring from this. If you, that may not be what yeah. you were asking. Okay. But okay. No, I actually meant something like that. Like what okay. Stanley yeah. did with the shit of the context. Yeah, in fact, I mean, this would be a good question for, for you or Karim is, even in the, in the Bergman fan and in the, the Chowering case, does knowing the shellability result of Garcia really help us in any way in analyzing the Chowering? I, I'm not aware of that, but I'll, I'd be curious to, to ask you guys about it. Good question. Okay, so let me tell you now about the, the two expressions for the homotopy type that come from this. The augmented Bergman complex, since it's shellable, its geometric realization will be a wedge of spheres. The, we know the dimensions of the spheres, the dimension of the complex. It's the rank of the matroid minus one. How many spheres in the wedge, the beta? On the one hand, it's the top polynomial at one comma one, not zero one, not one zero, but one comma one, which is just the number of bases. That comes from the type one shellings because of what I said. Every time you finish the last part of your type one shellings, you put in one of these basis facets and it's fully attached and they are the, the homology facets, exactly. And so you get one for each basis, so the matroid. On the other hand, when you do the type two shellings, that's, you get homology facets at every stage. You know, even in these intermediate stages, some of these purple facets end up being homology facets, but you analyze them. And because you were breaking ties, you know, using the, the proven Bolera shellings for the independent set complexes of restrictions, 
And the Garcia shellings for, in, for the Bergman fans, excuse me, Bergman complexes of quotients, you end up with this expression where you, the beta is the sum over all of the flats and you take the tut polynomial at zero and one for restricting the matoid, matroid to that flat, which just in the vector terms, it just means taking a subset of the vectors that lie in that flat and only looking at that matroid. Or, sorry, and you multiply by the tut at one comma zero for the quotient by that flat. And that is if you had representable matroids by re represented by a bunch of vectors, m mod f is you picked some flat that contains some of the vectors. Now you look in the quotient space by that, that subspace, that flat. And the images of the other vectors give you uh, the quotient matroid and its tut polynomial at one zero. So it's a convolution of these two kinds of betas that came from before. And that's naturally how it comes out in the type two shellings. So they're really different, these, these two kinds of shellings. But it's good that they're consistent because the fact that the number of bases, the tut polynomial at one comma one is a convolution of these tut at zero one for the restrictions, tut at one zero for the quotients. This is actually known. This was showed up first in work of Etienne and Las Vernas in 1998. And actually there was work that uh, Wung Cook and I and, and Dennis Stanton were doing in 2000 about the, the Laplacian matrices and the spectra of Laplacians for independent set complexes. We ran across this, this same fact. We didn't actually realize that it had, was in this paper of Etienne and Las Vernas, but. So this is a well-known identity that explains why the two beta expressions should be the same. And it's actually, a, there's a convolution formula for the tut polynomial, even when you have both variables. Tut at x, y is a convolution of tut for the restrictions to flats at zero y and tut for the restrictions of flats at x zero. So we, we knew about this. I think they also knew about this, the ATN and Las Vernas. okay? So this, this was one of the surprises for me was like, oh, you actually, these two shellings, there's something interesting when you compare their, their homotopy type formulas. But here's the thing that I found more interesting <laughs> or more surprising actually. Um, those type one shellings uh, actually, as I said, since the bases are exactly the homology facets, until you get to the end, the thing is contractible. Let me, let me name that thing. Right before you add in any of the homology facets, you remove all the homology facets. That's a shellable contractible subcomplex. And suppose there's symmetry to my matroid. Suppose there are permutations of the ground set that preserve the independent sets or preserve the flats as equivalent. Then you get symmetries of these simplicial complexes of the augmented Bergman complex let's call those matroid automorphisms, let me just call it aught m, they will always send bases to bases. They always take these homology facets and send them to other homology facets. And that tells you that when you look at the way the symmetries of the matroid act on the top homology, say with integer coefficients even, it's a very simple representation. It's a signed permutation representation in which for each basis, right, b, you have an oriented simplex where you, you know, order the, the elements in the basis. And when you do oriented simplicial homology to compute your, your homology of the complex, you have these oriented chains for each basis. They just get permuted up to sign. You apply your automorphism, it permutes them inside the this square bracket. And then you have to introduce some plus or minus sign to reorder them into your favorite ordering of the basis. So my point is just that the, the action of the symmetries of the matroid on the top homology is very, very simple here. I've done an example. In our favorite example, we have these various bases, which were the facets here. They give these oriented simplices within the, our oriented chain complex. And here's the automorphisms of this matroid. You can swap the one and two. Those things can be swapped by symmetries of the matroid. You can swap the three and the four. You can do them both simultaneously. So it's a little group that's isomorphic to Z mod two cross Z mod two. And I've said what the generators, the, the one, two swap and the three, four swap, I've said what they did to these basis elements in the homology. And here you see some sign happening. So 
the swap one, two takes Y1, Y2 and changes it to Y2, Y1, that oriented simplex gets negated because you to reorder the variables, you have to introduce a sign. And it happens the way I wrote down the rest of them. These generators don't even introduce any signs, but it's a very simple signed permutation representation on the top homology. That is very rare. It's, it's surprising. I want to remark on this. For the independent set complex or for the Bergman complex, when you look at their top homology, we know how many spheres we have this kind of unnatural formula in terms of external or internal activity. It's very rare that we have a good, simple description of the automorphisms of the matroid acting on them. It does act, but they're non-trivial representations. Maybe not in this case, you know, where you have the Boolean matroid, you do get the trivial representation on that simplex because there's no homology. But already, even for the Bergman complex, you get the sign representation of SN is slightly non-trivial for the, for the uh, um, automorphisms acting in this case, for the Boolean case. When we take the, the Q analog of the Boolean matroid, that's the lattice of all subspaces over F. The connection is Victor. Good. Yeah, we seem to having some connection errors. Victor, can you still hear us? I can hear you. So you seem to be frozen. We still hear you from time to time. But okay. Ah, now, now you're back. Now I'm back. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Probably now. just something that hung up. Yeah. Uh, your screen sharing is done though. Yeah, I see that. I am going to fix that. Hopefully. Yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. Hopefully we'll back be back in a second here. Usually my internet is pretty stable. So. Yeah, it was so far. Yeah, we see the screen sharing again as well. Right. Wonderful. So as QA we don't really know independent set complex. We have a virtual expression, but it's it's not a very explicit uh, thing. And also uh, a famous example is the braid arrangements. So when you take the hyperplanes xi equals xj, in uh, excuse me, when I take the the vectors EI minus EJ, where EIs are standard basis vectors. This is an important matroid with a lot of symmetry, symmetric group symmetry. Even when you look at its independent set complex as a representation of the symmetric group, we don't know a good description of it. Although when we restrict to SN minus one, it has a nice permutation representation description that was described by Cook in, in his thesis. And if you look at the Bergman complexes, uh, for example, in this, this vector space lattice case, the Q analog of the Boolean matroid, this is an interesting non-trivial representation of GLNFQ, the finite general linear group. It's called the Steinberg representation. And it's not a, you know, a sign permutation representation. It's, it's much more non-trivial than that. And for this case of the braid arrangement, then this re representation on the Bergman complex homology is what's called the Lie representation. It's the multilinear part of the free Lie algebra with a symmetric group action. It's a highly non-trivial representation. It's not such some, it's not as simple as like a signed permutation representation. So I just wanna emphasize augmented Bergman's homology is much simpler with respect to the, simple, the uh, symmetry of the matroid. And I, I don't wanna, sorry, go on for too much longer. I, I, pardon me that I'm, I'm taking quite a long time. Another somewhat surprising thing for me is that instead of thinking about matroid closures on a finite set, you can actually look at closure operators that are arbitrary on a finite set. You can define a notion of independent sets and an independence complex for your closure operator. You can look at the, the bases are the ones that close to the improper set. You can define flats or the closed sets. You can define an augmented Bergman complex in exactly the same way. And let me not belabor it, but the point is that independence complex, that Bergman complex, and the augmented Bergman complex, they're not even pure. They're not shellable in general. They're, they can look kind of nasty, but 
this homotopy statement actually turns out to still be true. You can still show that the homotopy, excuse me, the geometric realization is a wedge of spheres indexed by the bases, whatever the definition of the bases that I gave on the previous page. And so the, the representation of the symmetries of your, oh, this should be ought of F, the symmetries of your closure operator still act in this nice signed permutation way on the homology of this more general kind of augmented Bergman complex. And the point is again, that you take away these, the facets indexed by bases and that's key. So, thank you for your attention. We seem to be having the same issues again, Victor. Maybe one option is that you could turn off your camera that might save some bandwidth. Yes. Can you hear me? I'll stop. So you're still frozen on my side. We hear you, I can hear you from time to time. But okay. Well, I think the experience that I've talked on. Okay, you're you're still breaking off, unfortunately. Okay, it seems like we have lost our speaker completely, so I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. All right, there we go. Recording in progress. Okay, now I'll start. Yeah, sorry, I had to mute you there for a second, Vic, because we have the echo. And you're muted now because. Now, do you have the echo? Yeah, I had to. Sorry, we're now on my phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what, what happened. It, I I'm, suspect that it's on my end, which usually I don't have internet problems. So sorry about that. Anyway, my apologies for, for going on very long and for, for the internet issues. Patrick, do you wanna share the slides maybe then? Yeah, so is there still something that you wanna talk about on the slides or were you oh no 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 I, I i was done with the slides okay you know, only... wonderful um so so in that case i guess thank you for your talk and i guess we are ready for questions no so are there any questions thanks Vic. it was wonderful oh Can thanks for coming tell how you show this uh, homo uh, found the homotopy type in those uh, last on the last slide when you could, didn't have the solubility Oh yeah. So what you can do is um, once you remove those homology facets for the, you're talking about the more general closures, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. So when these, these bases are the ones that are um, independent sets. Okay, so first you define what an independent set is and then the bases are the ones whose closure is the whole set E what you can show by a quillen fiber argument is after you remove those facets from this augmented Bergman com complex of the closure, you can do a quillen fiber uh, contraction of that subcomplex onto the cone over the Bergman complex. So you just do a post set argument that shows why. And I think you have to do, sorry, you have to do a barycentric subdivision first in order to get everything into the world of post sets if I want to use a quillen fiber argument. But essentially it's a deformation retraction onto the cone over the Bergman complex after you remove the, the basis facets. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? I think we're about to. I think that, uh... 
some of these uh, construction can be generalized uh, to polymetroids? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Roberta. You know, Botang Wong, who's at Madison, not too far down the road here um, in the US, he has students who have been thinking about polymetroids and the various constructions in terms of uh, invariant theory. They think about it in terms of when you have the polymetroid like a finite group action on the matroid and you're, you're taking the invariance. And I I'm, don't quite remember how that story goes. And so some of those students, I think, have started to think about the associated fan that would be like the Bergman fan. And they were just visiting here recently for a conference. And we talked about maybe you can do it also for the augmented Bergman fan. I think the issue is then the you get it's going to be a simplicial fan, but I don't believe it's a unimodular fan in that story. And so these are the kinds of things that come up. But you should definitely talk to, to Botong and you know he can point you to work of his students. They've thought about this a little bit. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Is there a no result for an H vector of the augmented Bergman complex? Oh uh, yeah, this is this is also a great question. Um, so our our students tried. Um, they didn't come up with a good expression for it, and I think ultimately they convinced me that it was hard because the same question for Bergman complexes is already a bit hard, right? When we take a geometric lattice and ask for its H vector. For example, we don't have a simple polynomial evaluation for that H vector. And um, I don't really know of simple expressions for that. And I think that's the reason why we're running into the same trouble for the augmented Bergman, but we, we could have missed something. So yeah, we, we did think about it a bit. Okay, do we have any other questions? If not, then thanks again, Victor, for the nice talk and the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will stop the recording.